So a while ago, I was looking for some anime recommendations in r slash anime suggest, and somebody told me that Star Temple Precure had a good soundtrack. I mean, it is Yuki Hayashi, so it seemed like a pretty safe bet. So I just finished it, and it's now in my top five. This is a show for babies, so I'm aware convincing you that it's as good as it is will take some work, but please just hear me out. When I was, I don't know, 13 or 14, the first anime I ever watched was Sailor Moon, and I barely got through that. Since then, I haven't seen any magical girl shows other than Madoka Magica, which isn't really what we're talking about here. I'm aware how weird, childish, and dumb this show looks, but let me just easy on it. The show is remarkably tight thematically, and on that foundation is both the lively characters, incredible soundtrack, and uh, rule of three or something. So let me give you a quick rundown. Also, there aren't really any plot twists or anything, so you can't really spoil the show per se, but I'm going to spoil the ending anyway, or whatever. A battle rages in the stars. The Notres launch an assault on the Star Palace with the intent of blotting out the imagination of the universe. The Star Princesses hold out as long as they can, but eventually, the palace falls. The Star Princesses scatter across space and send out Fua, the vessel of imagination, to find fighters to turn the tide. On the other side of the galaxy, stargazing in her room, Oshina Hikaru uses the power of her imagination to summon Fua and become one of the legendary warriors, the Precure. <coughs> <clears throat> yeah, so uh, Hikaru becomes fast friends with this alien Lala, and they run around saving people and get their posse together in the process. Elena, the Japanese-Mexican big sister, Madoka, the rich student council president, and Yuni, the shape-shifting idle cat burglar. From here, they engage in a pretty episodic structure where one of the recurring bad guys shows up, blots out somebody's imagination, and then loses to the Precure. The three main bad guys are fun and interesting too. We've got the kind of dominatrixy Tenjo, the accidentally genocidal Iwan, and the sort of gay Capard. Pretty heavy stuff for a kid show. I mean, like, deep. Despite the repetition, this is actually a very interesting structure. See, in order to blot out imagination, the victim needs to already feel depressed, stressed, or angry, and while in that state, it's very common for them to directly vocalize what is hurting them so much. This is a great choice narratively since most of the people are at least tangentially related to the main cast, meaning that every fight scene has stakes of both physical and emotional varieties. One good example of these physical and emotional stakes is in episode 14. The gang is excited to meet and spend time with Elena's father, but her brother Toma isn't. Their dad is from Mexico, and he brought a lot of customs and behaviors from his home country that seem strange to Toma's Japanese friends. Toma, being an edgy 10-year-old, yells at his parents and runs off in a tizzy. Eventually, Lala finds him, and they have a nice discussion about how different cultures may seem weird from the outside, but for one on the inside, life without those quirks is just as weird. In this moment, we get to see how much Lala has already learned on Earth and how much she wants to share that with others. Tenjo pops in and blots out Toma's imagination, and during that fight, we get to see Elena's desperation. Multiple times, she jumps in too early, and after the fight, we can see her relief. After the fight, they all go back to the family's party, and we can see how the family dynamic is only resolved once everybody is there. This informs a lot about Elena's character, how she values family, how she often places the burden of others' issues on herself, how she strives to understand others' opinions and accommodate for those in her views. We learn about each of the Precure and about Elena's family. Nearly every episode is this concise. Every single action has repercussions for every character, and these allow us to get to know them better. Most of the time the Precure do win, but they do lose on occasion, and when they do, they lose hard. In a very early excursion, in episode 10, they get absolutely bodied. They lose the MacGuffin they were trying to get, as well as one of the ones they already had. They struggle for the rest of the episode, only to be forced into a sloppy retreat. They limp back to Earth where they pick up next week and barely drag a win out of the hat. Losses like these don't happen often, but they happen often enough to remind us that the Precure aren't invincible. Despite their power, they are still just young girls out of their depth, doing their best. We spend so much time with these characters, while fighting and not, stressed and calm, joyful and sad, that it's really hard not to get attached to them. I don't think there's a single character I don't like. Puruns and Fua can be a little bit annoying at times, but it never gets to the point of frustration. Probably the best example of what Star Twinkle does with its characters is with Hikaru herself. Now you may think, hey, she's the main character, of course she gets time to be fleshed out and become likable, but at first glance, it wouldn't seem that way. See, Hikaru is the pink one. 
Just think about any anime you've seen. The pink one is always worst girl. Not you, Nadeshko. Hikaru is really loud, talks a fair bit, is aggressively xenophilic, and since she was the first precure, she's the de facto leader, despite being far stupider than any of her friends. I've dipped lightly into the precure community, and she seems to be controversial because of all these traits. And, you know, fair enough. I understand why people wouldn't like Hikaru, but she's actually a lot more than what meets the eye. Hikaru is the perfect leader and figurehead for this specific season of Precure. Other Precure shows have their power system based on like flowers or sweets or whatever, but Star Twinkle's power is derived from imagination. Every character has some relation to imagination, how they imagine others, their family, themselves. Hikaru is perfect to lead this season since she's the most openly imaginative. The reason she's so loud is that she gets so excited about learning new things. The reason she's so intense about meeting new people is that she can't wait to learn new things from them and see their perspectives. All of her interests are based in either learning or creating something new. She draws, watches for cryptids, and stargazes. Hikaru also cements the connection from imagination to love through her relationship with her parents. Her mom is a mangaka, and so Hikaru draws and thinks creatively about her stories. Probably my favorite fight in the show is when Tenjo blots out Hikaru's mom's imagination after her new comic flopped and was cancelled. The only way this fight gets won is by Hikaru exclaiming how much her mom's manga has meant to her. Torumi once made a short story for kindergarten Hikaru to cheer her up while she was being bullied, and the lesson she learned from the manga informed the person she'd become. Her mom taught her that it's okay to like different things, and we know what a xenophile Hikaru is. The manga was filled with imagination and wonder, which is kind of Hikaru's whole thing, and Hikaru learned how much she enjoyed watching the people she loves do what they love. Even though Hikaru is generally the stupidest one in the group, we never really get the sense that she's dumb. I mean, she ends up being on Japan's first men's space flight, so we know she isn't an idiot. We get to see her being quiet, introspective, and respectful, so it's not hard to remember that she is, in fact, intelligent. One thing that sets her apart from the only other Precure shows I know anything about is that she was entirely responsible for becoming a Precure. In other scenarios, a villain is attacking, and so the lead is told she has to become a Precure to become strong enough to defend herself. When threatened by Capard, she hit on the ship, knowing full well it was leaving Earth, and eventually jumped right out of the broken window to protect Hua. At no point did she have to be convinced to defend people, she was already doing that, and then the power was given to her. What's more is after becoming a Precure, the first thing she does is stand up for Fuwa's right to choose for herself. Because every fight is tied up in the theme of imagination, they can get really interesting. Each bad guy has their own failure of imagination, putting them in opposition to a Precure. Kapard comes from a planet that got colonized and subsequently sucked dry, so he has a really hard time imagining a world where different species can get along. This puts him directly at odds with Lala and Hikaru, who are not only best friends from different planets, but have also found joy in accepting others different from them and respectfully engaging with their cultures. Tenjo doesn't conform to the physical standards of her culture and has been condescended to her whole life behind fake smiles, so she can't believe Elena when she puts on a smile to help those around her feel better. Garu Oga lost his home and family, and so thinks protecting others is a show of weakness. This puts him at odds with Madoka, who has only found her true strength after fighting with and for her friends. I want and Yuni get paired up because the whole genocide thing. They uh get over it somehow. This means that each and every confrontation has a direction. The characters' motivations are all plainly laid out and clearly in opposition, and so conflict ensues. This is another reason why the fights are so much fun. I mentioned with Elena and her brother how the Precure's loved ones are always in danger, but not only that, the villains directly oppose their worldviews. This means that the Precure have to band up and fight together, and consequently lots of fights are won by the power of friendship. Despite that, I still like these fights more than typical shonen fights. In shonen, it's more, I know I have it in me, believe in you who believes in yourself, or I can do better. Hey, those are all the same thing, aren't they? Here, it makes a lot more sense because their motivations are clearly spelled out and a lot closer to, I have spent lots of time with these people, they've had an impact on my life, and I'm willing to protect that. I know they do the same. Somehow it's more emotionally engaging despite being for literal babies. The animation work also really helps the fights along. Admittedly, much of the time characters just kind of stand around, but when they need to, Toei really pulls out all the stops. The fight scenes that need to stand out do. Maybe I'm just a sucker for oneers. In most of the transformation sequences, ending themes, or special moves, 3D models are used, and I think this is the best looking 3D anime I've seen. I haven't seen Land of the Lustrous or Beast Stars. Don't hurt me. 3D anime is hard because it's sort of fitting a square peg in a round hole. Obviously, 3D animation can look great, just look at any Pixar movie. Textures can look incredibly realistic without sacrificing movement, but only when the art style has taken 3D into account. 
Anime rarely thinks about what 3D will look like in the world, normally just using it as a cost saving measure. This is why the 3D Titans look so weird. It's not really that they're animated poorly, but rather that they're in a different art style than everything around them and are pretending so hard to be something they just aren't. Star Twinkle knows exactly when and why to use 3D. It only gets used when the camera needs to quickly wrap around highly detailed objects or when those highly detailed objects need to move quickly, thus transformation sequences, ending themes, and special moves. Even in those specific situations, Toei really capitalizes on the strengths of 3D and it never feels like we're missing fidelity. Movements don't feel at all robotic, they don't feel rigid or locked in place. Honestly, it looks really good. I opened this up talking about how I started the show because I heard the music was good. Is it? Yes. Yes it is. I mentioned at the top that Yuki Hayashi did the music, but in fact it's him together with Asami Tachibana. She's done the music for Moriarty the Patriot and Darling in the Franks, which I haven't seen. And they collaborated on Soul Eater Not and Haikyuu, which I have seen but don't remember very well. Each track is great to listen to both by itself and in the context of the rest of the show. Just like they've done elsewhere, they use one melody and then reuse it somewhere else. This is the transformation song. It gets played every time they, well, transform. After they all unlock the power of Twinkle Imagination, we hear the same melody again, but faster and more upbeat. This is what we hear when the group is just kind of hanging out. That turns into one of the battle themes so we don't forget the end goal. It even gets used for the mid-episode breaks. That's all awesome and I love it, but there is one moment of absolutely incredible musical composition at the end of the show. At this point, it looks like the battle has been lost. It's not just the battle though. The villain, Darkness, is intent on remaking the entire universe, planning on destroying it in the process. She's already destroyed the galactic fleet, the uprising of her own troops, and she did both by using Fuwa's power, killing her and taking all power from the Precure. All hope looks lost. As a former Precure float powerless in space, Hikuru realizes that even if Fu is gone, she lives on in their imaginations. Dark Nest claimed to steal the imagination from everyone, but Hikuru knows that's impossible. She still has hers, after all. As she realizes this, she begins to sing a familiar tune. Why did you go so hard? This is a kid show! Are you trying to make me cry? Again? Before I go, just a couple quick little things that I really enjoy. There's one episode where they need to buy a MacGuffin from an auction and they convince the space aristocracy that some homemade donuts are worth enough to outbid Space Bezos. Uh, the McDonald's logo is in, in the opening credits. So there's tension building up the whole show for when they'd go, right? But they never did. I looked it up and there were some Precure Happy Meals and that was a good enough answer for me. Uh, we get to spend time with the families of every single Precure and see how their families have helped them grow, even Uni, who doesn't have a typical family structure. J.J. Uh, Abrams exists in this universe as a tiny alien piloting a human suit, uh, but he gets McDonald's, so his name is P.P. Abraham. <laughs> Am I like eight with them? <laughs> That's such a, such a, <clears throat> okay, let me try again. 